Hi, welcome to Amy Fisher at Large. I'm Amy Fisher, and today we're at the Zimmerle Museum in New Brunswick, where we're going to speak with uh, the new director of the museum and hear about the permanent exhibits, and also uh, speak with the curator of the wonderful temporary exhibit about George Siegel's work. So we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, Greg, you are the new director of the museum, and how long have you been at the Zimmerle? I've been at the Zimmerle about two years, and I've been director since the mid of October. And I understand that you came from the Art Institute of Chicago. How did right. you make the transition from Chicago to New Brunswick? Well, uh, I came out for the associate director job. Um, the Zimmerle had a very good reputation in the museum field, and I know they did a lot of interesting shows. It was a very active place, so uh, we came out for, for the job. and. Uh, We've enjoyed New Jersey and the proximity to a lot of other museums. Mm -hmm. It's a culturally very rich area. Yes. Of course, this is uh, quite a bit smaller than the Art Institute of Chicago. Do you right. like that idea that you have uh, a place that you can really work within and make a tremendous impact? Right. I think that transition was like many when you go from a larger organization to a smaller one. When you're in a larger one, you necessarily have um, a smaller, uh, more narrow role. And when you're a larger one and a smaller one, you get to be involved in everything that's going on in the museum. And that's what I wanted to do when I came here, is just to be involved in all facets of, of uh, a small and active museum. Yeah. Now, you have a background in law. How did you make the transition from law to art? Well, it was almost back to art, because I started with an undergraduate degree in art history. And then I worked in the art field, and then sort of combined my interests. And I worked for a not-for-profit organization that provided a uh, free legal service to artists and arts organizations mm -hmm. that couldn't afford it. Um, while I was doing that, I, I, started, um, I started doing research in art-related law. And uh, then I started, do, once I was a lawyer, I started doing volunteer legal work for some museums in Chicago. So I always had my hand in, in the art side of things. And then eventually had an opportunity at, at the Art Institute and just moved over full time. That's so, great. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about the permanent exhibits at the Zimmerle. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as you might know, we have uh, several sort of disparate co collections that are strong. Uh, we have, we're very well known for our Soviet 20th century collections, about 21,000 pieces of nonconformist Soviet art um, from the mid-50s to the mid-80s. It's the largest collection of its type in the world. We have a historical Russian collection that goes from the 14th century through the 20th century. Um, a lot of that uh, is, is very similar to European art of the same time but it's going on in Russia. So there's Russian Impressionism and there's um, Russian um, older portraiture that sort of is similar to what was going on in France in the, say, 17th century. Um, we have a very strong American survey collection that goes from the colonial times to the present, uh, 20th century collection. And we're also very well known for our French uh, 19th century, particularly in the uh, area of graphics and now sculpture. And you also have a, quite an extensive collection of children's illustrations? Yes, illustrations for children's literature. And uh, that's been a very popular, very popular collection. Our gallery presentation is, is more popular with adults than we thought it would be. It's, uh, it's, uh, yes, it's been, it's been very popular. Now, you have uh, quite an extensive education program also. Uh, right. Could you tell us about some of those programs? We have a very active education program. Um, we have programs for, for children. We do uh, many, stu many, um, many um, tours for students. Uh, we have uh, a lot of adult programs, lectures. We have a poetry series. We have a, a music series. Um, so we really, it's, it's a panoply of programs. There's a, there's a wide variety of things that we offer, and um, there are quite a number of them. This is a wonderful resource for Central New Jersey because it's really relatively easy to get here. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you come on a Sunday, there's no traffic and lots of parking spaces. Right. So it's a great right. place to take your family. Now there's a special exhibit, a very special exhibit right now of George Siegel. So we're going to take a little time and talk with uh, Mr. Wexler, who's the curator of that exhibit, and then we'll come back with you.
Now we're with Jeffrey Wexler, who is the curator of this wonderful exhibit of George Siegel's works. Uh, Mr. Wexler, could you tell us about this really huge exhibit and what makes mm -hmm. it unique? Sure. Well, of course, uh, George Siegel is a very well-known artist, uh, internationally known, and especially in this area, of course, since he was a resident of South Brunswick, he, to some extent, is a local artist. A lot of people knew him personally. Uh, so we were always interested in having a George Siegel exhibition and worked with him just a few years, actually, before he died, of course, uh, to create the ex exhibition. There have been so many shows, we were interested in how we could possibly make it a bit different than shows before. He's had retrospectives all over the world, hundreds, literally. Yeah. So when we were working with him, I was in the studio, and as I went around his studio, seeing all the different pieces that are all through the area, I started to realize that there was an aspect of his art which really wasn't that well emphasized or really that well known by the public. I mean, everybody sort of knows a George Siegel. Yes. They know there's a, an environment with a table or a chair or some object, yes. and there's a white plaster figure in it. That's what he's well known for. That was in his early career. But throughout his entire career, he actually did not only sculptures which are on the floor, like the environments, but works which are on the wall. Not only two-dimensional, but three-dimensional. We had, he did paintings, he did drawings, pastels, and he also did a great amount of sculpture, which is actually wall-mounted, relief sculpture on the wall. So we decided in this exhibition to emphasize that, to show this is a whole aspect of his art, which really shows all the different things he was interested in, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. So certainly we have some of the environments, because people enjoy them, and it's yes. an important part of his art. We have about six of them here. But essentially, most of the show, over 90% of the show, is wall-mounted pieces, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Now, right here, in the, where we're starting out, is um, his early work. Right. And uh, so could you tell us, for example, about this sure. painting? Sure. Well, his paintings in general, uh, this is a good example of it, uh, he was actually, he actually started as a painter. A lot of people think he went directly into sculpture, but that's not the case. He started as a painter, and his work, uh, late 50s and early 60s, uh, were the paintings we have in the show from that period, were very similar to uh, an important style happening in New York and nationwide at that time. Uh, it was the years or decade after abstract expressionism, people like Jackson Pollock and Mark mm -hmm. Rothko and Willem de Kooning, and there was an interest by some artists of being very gestural and active in their paint handling like this with bright colors, active gestures and, and brush strokes, but still maintaining naturalism in sense, the figure or something which is realistic. So he was one of those people who we're working in what was sometimes called figurative expressionism. So he fit right into that mode, and these are the types of paintings he did. Uh, he had shows in New York, which were, uh, which were successful, but right from the beginning, what's interesting, as you look at all the paintings, you'll see he really immediately showed people what he was going to do. He was immediately interested in the human figure, yeah. uh, usually the, usually the uh, female model in the studio or in an environment, uh, what his sculpture would be. He always was a person who dealt with the human figure. So right from the beginning, he did that. He, of course, made the change into sculpture pretty quickly, but this was his subject. Yes. Now, he also uh, was very uh, interested in other artists, sure. and, mm -hmm. and some of his work oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, reflects that mm -hmm. interest. Oh, yeah. Uh, throughout his work, whether sculpture or two-dimensional work, but possibly in particular two-dimensional work, he really showed the artists that he admired a lot. He was very open about it. He didn't see it as, uh, you know, as a question of imitating somebody. He right. saw himself as just another artist in the overall uh, sort of history of art who was working with this very, very classical theme, the figure, yeah. the artist, and his model. So he was interested in, for example, in modern art. He was interested in uh, Matisse and Degas, mm -hmm. in particular Degas. And you'll see that in his drawings, in his early drawings, his pastels, and even in some of his sculptural work, because the, the guy was always interested in the female figure, usually mm -hmm. nude, uh, in, an, in, a, in, the, in a room or an environment, and with a lot of interesting twisting poses, you know, really mm -hmm. making the person bend and twist, and often cutting the figure off at the edge. And you'll see that both in Siegel's pastels and in the reliefs, that the figure is cut off towards the head, towards the arm, something mm -hmm. is not complete. And that was very interesting to him in terms of composition. Uh, he was always interested in Cezanne because Siegel himself, one of the reasons he went from painting to sculpture was he felt that within painting, he wasn't really getting the three-dimensional, <laughs> the spatial qualities that he was looking for. He really became become very interested in that. So Cezanne was one of the artists who really tried to create some sort of spatial activity in a two-dimensional surface. And as doing that, Siegel was very interested in that because that's what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. So you'll see both pastels that are based on Cezanne's still lifes, as well as a very interesting piece, which is really a three-dimensional almost projection of a Cezanne still life into three dimensions, where mm -hmm. he actually creates the still life 
in three-dimensional forms, but has strange angles, strange distortions, which make it look like it's in between somehow a painting and a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And that's something he was very interested in. Yeah. And one other artist who was very important to him was, was an earlier artist, of course, was Rembrandt. Yeah. And that would be, that's sort of surprising. Because well, Siegel was a very humanist artist and person. He was always interested in the human condition. He was very empathetic with people, everyday people, ordinary people, what they did on an everyday basis. As you know, some of his environments are just people walking down the street, people yeah. sitting having a cup of coffee. That type of simple everyday uh, activity was very significant to him. So he was always a humanist. So Rembrandt was one of the major artists to just sort of see the human being and the human face as a conveyor of emotion, of internal human uh, emotion and ideas. So he turned to Rembrandt. Uh, from the late 80s, right up until his death, he did a large series of very large black and white drawings, which featured the human face or close-ups of people or people in relatively dark environments. Yeah. And this very much was like what Rembrandt did. They are really beautiful. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're beautiful works. They're uh, emphasizing that Rembrandt quality by the contrast of black and white. Uh, even Rembrandt's etchings, even more than his paintings, which of course were black and white. And you can see a lot of relationship with the, the, the uh, dramatic light from one, sur one, from one source, uh, people in, in very dark environments, uh, very interesting, sometimes a mysterious mood is created. Mm -hmm. So he was very much interested in that at that time, and Rembrandt is an interesting uh, earlier influence. Well, this is a really huge exhibit. I, oh, yeah. And <laughs> how were you able to arrange for it? Well, uh, fortunately, when we... Uh, Went to George Siegel originally for the concept of the show. Uh, Dennis Kate, who's director of the museum now, is um, uh, the uh, supervisor for curatorial activities here, mm -hmm. uh, was interested in that show. We spoke to George Siegel. Uh, uh, we both visited him, and he was very much for the show. Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned that it was going to travel, and that's an uh, important point about the show. This show is the last venue, the last leg of a very long international trip. It went to Japan, several museums, and it went to the Hermitage wow. in Russia. And that was something that George Siegel was very, very interested in. He was very uh, pleased at the possibility of getting the show to go to Russia. Mm -hmm. So he cooperated from the beginning. He was very happy with the exhibition. And we basically organized it as we saw fit. Uh, we worked, of course, with the Japanese uh, uh, organization, which was sending the show to Japan. But basically, uh, we worked out that wall-mounted theme and then selected from that to create the exhibition. So. George basically let us do <laughs> the curatorial mm -hmm. work. He had done the art, and we did the curatorial work. So this is a wonderful opportunity for people in our area to oh, see this, this work, because oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's not going anywhere else, and it's right. very convenient to people mm -hmm. who live mm -hmm. in the East Brunswick area. Right, it's so. the last stop, and besides the fact that I said that people certainly know George Siegel, this is an aspect yeah. of his art which people tend not to know. Mm -hmm. And already from the people who've come in, I've found people saying, oh yes, I did not know about the paintings. I did not right. know about many of the drawings. I didn't know right. this many reliefs were produced. So it's yeah. still an eye opener for a very familiar artist. And all of it is quite amazing. The pastels are mm -hmm. really beautiful mm -hmm. also. And then also you have, as you said, some of the tradition, what you associate with George Siegel, the right. environments. And actually you have one in your foyer that is right. permanent mm -hmm. here, right. the bus stops. Mm -hmm. huh? Yes, we, we acquired the bus shelter a few years ago. And that's in the lobby, so people mm -hmm. see it as they come in. So now, in a certain sense, it's an introduction to this larger exhibition. It is a wonderful exhibit. I would just wonder if you could just comment on this uh, mm -hmm. sculpture and painting combination here, which is interesting. Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, Siegel started as a painter and became uh, not dissatisfied with painting, per se, but was very interested in trying to work out more concepts of, of spatial uh, dimensions. Uh, and he started to experiment with sculpture, which was the obvious step into three, into three dimensions. Uh, this particular work uh, uses a painting as a integral background of the sculpture. It's together, they create one work. And uh, it's very, very early. In fact, it's not even using uh, the technique which he'd become well known for, which is casting directly from the figure with right. these uh, plaster soaked bandages. Right. Uh, he did not do that at this point. He started as a... Uh, person might do at the beginning of sculpture, creating an armature, a support structure, mm -hmm. and then simply putting plaster onto it, which is what this figure is. So his other works in the show, all the other works in the show, when you see plaster figures, are from the casting. This is one of his very early works, mm -hmm. which he had not sort of discovered that right. method yet. 
That was and his own technique that he developed, right? He's the first person to use that, right. that technique. The casting technique was important to him because knowing the history of art very well, which he did, when he saw the implications of what he could do by putting those plaster soaked bandages onto the figure and simply getting the uh, shape there, he knew that artists, in terms of the history of art, were not supposed to do that. Because that, in a certain sense, was, was cheating. Yes. You know, you're supposed to take the, take the clay and model it and form it or take a piece of marble and chip it away and mm. create your shape, create your figure. He realized that this was something that was uh, frowned, frowned upon. And in fact, the uh, artist, sculptor Rodin, another artist who was influential to Siegel, was even once very much chastised uh, by, the, uh, by art critics who thought he had cast from the figure. He actually hadn't, but his work was so beautifully lifelike they thought he had. But Siegel said, well, you know, this has interesting implications. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to present it because I think this will really work and do what I want to do in sculpture. So we did. And from then on, you know, the, the late, the, you know, about 1960 or so, right. from then on, he was going to do that cast plaster technique. Yeah, and it has certainly created wonderful work. Oh, absolutely. Well, thanks very much for oh, sure. talking with us and explaining uh, this great art. Could you just tell us how long this exhibit will be up? Uh, it'll be on for quite a long time. It's beyond until, I believe, May 25th, I okay. believe, is the last day. So it'll be on for a very long run for the museum. But we want to present it for a good long time so right. basically the community and uh, other people in the area can see. Well, Greg, obviously you have a lot of wonderful programs here. What will be the impact of the proposed uh, budget cuts that the governor is talking about f in the arts? Because basically what the proposal is to cut out all funding for the arts. So what will happen to the right. Zimmerle? Um, we still have to assess uh, what's, what's going to happen. Obviously it's going to have a significant impact on, on what we can do and the kind of exhibitions we can do and the programs we can offer. Um, unfortunately the Zimmerle is in a position to be facing two cuts. The governor's also made substantial cuts to higher education and uh, we'll feel that, that through, through Rutgers, as well as the elimination of the, uh, of the State Arts Council. Um, that's, it's practically an unprecedented measure, and I think it would have a very uh, significant impact on not, not only the Zimmerle, but arts, uh, arts organizations across the state. So we would have to look very carefully at our programs um, and see, well, frankly, what, what would have to be cut, because with, with cuts, of uh, that magnitude, you just you have to start thinking what's what you can't do. Right. Yeah. So actually, the the uh, the cuts, if they do take place, would be in July, I presume, when the new fiscal right. year begins. So until then, uh, I guess you and other arts organization leaders are are hoping that things will change and that right. some of the at least some of the money will be restored because I believe it's 18 million dollars total, which in the scheme of the whole budget is. It's not a, not a tremendous amount, but what it will mean to each organization will be substantial. Right, and I think the smaller the organization is, the more it's going to hurt because it's probably a larger percentage of their given operating budget. Um, so we're going to be involved with other organizations to, uh, to sort of conduct a sort of advocacy and education effort mm -hmm. about what these cuts will mean. And uh, we'll probably have something in our lobby, as a lot of other organizations will, for people to, uh, to encourage people to send something, uh, send a letter into their legislators to, uh, to let them know how they feel about this issue. Because it's, it doesn't just directly affect the arts, uh, it also affects, it, there's an economic impact. Yes. Um, the arts organizations, when they get state support for projects, this also leverages private support that comes in. Mm -hmm. The arts are a huge employer in this state of, mm -hmm. uh, of a lot of residents. So um, there's going to be a direct impact, a direct economic impact, as well as the loss of a lot of our cultural vitality in the state if these cuts go through as proposed. Well, for also just the surrounding businesses that are affected when people come to see things in the arts. I mean, right. people come to the Zimmerle, and I now go to lunch in, in New Brunswick. Right. So if they don't come to the Zimmerle, they will, probably won't be going to lunch. So it has a lot of ramifications. Um, one of the ways, I guess, that you make up, you've never had a lot of money. Any of the arts organizations in New Jersey have never had all the funds that they need to really operate. So you have a pretty extensive volunteer program. We Could do, you? yes. Uh, the volunteers help with, uh, with uh, several different aspects of what we do here. They help with community outreach. Um, they help us organize some concerts and events. And they also help us with staffing. Uh, we have over 100 volunteers uh, who are fairly active in the workings of the museum. and. Um, 
they're, they're an absolutely uh, invaluable resource for us. So can anyone come and be a volunteer who's, who would like to? Sure, anyone who can, uh, we welcome them to become a member and a volunteer. Uh, we have some uh, interesting projects for people to work on. You can be involved in the arts, be involved in exhibitions. Uh, it's, it's a good opportunity for someone to be involved in their community and be involved in a, in a vibrant cultural organization. Now you also have an extensive membership list. I, um, what are the benefits of becoming a member of the Zimmerle? Right. Well, like many organizations, you get, you get free, um, the free admittance to the museum, you get a discount at our bookstore, um, and also you have the opportunity to come to special openings for our exhibitions. And you're also informed of all the volunteer, the, the member and volunteer trips mm -hmm. that we run. So um, you're just uh, you're more well informed and exposed to the programs we do, and then there are the obvious discounts that, that one gets. Right. If uh, people want to join uh, or find out about um, your hours and you know the fees and things like that, uh, is there a telephone number they can call? Sure, they can call us at 732-932-7237, and we'll be happy to answer their questions. Great. Now tell us a little bit about um, what you plan for the future, assuming that you will have the funds to carry mm -hmm. out your plans. Mm -hmm. right. What do you have planned? Well, we, um, I want to keep the, uh, the strong um, exhibition program going. We have uh, um, a very good uh, international exhibition program. We send exhibitions around the world and we bring them into the Zimmerle. And that's really important for, for visitors, in the, for, for people in this community to be exposed to that, to that kind of work. Um, so I want to keep that going. But we also want to get people from the community to come in, um, maybe more than they've been coming in. And we want to create some shows that focus on our disparate permanent collections and put some thematic shows together. Um, so we would draw works from American and Russian and French and Soviet around uh, one or more themes. So <clears throat> these shows hopefully will appeal to people. They'll be about themes that they're very familiar with, such as uh, religion or portraiture or the family. So even if you don't know about the, the history of art in a given region, you know about the family or you know about portraiture and there's things that you can recognize. And we want to do that, sort of have some vibrant displays of, what, uh, of, of our disparate collections here. Mm -hmm. How many professional uh, staff members do you have? We have about 50 people that work here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's really not a very large staff considering all the, the very uh, diverse amount of uh, work that you have here. Right. Well, I have to tell you, say that my favorite part of the museum, well, I, I like lots of different parts, but I think my favorite part is the uh, early American where you, where there's, you trace in, that, in the room that was originally the live part of the library right. here when it right. was, was the library of Rutgers University. And I think the building itself there is very fascinating. Do you know mm -hmm. about the history of the building up there well, at all? I think the, the building dates from 1909. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it was the Rutgers Library until the uh, mid to early 50s. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice space, a very attractive space. Yes. It's a nice rotunda area. And uh, it's very conducive to looking at art. And uh, yeah. that, that entrance area that you talk about is one of my favorites as well. It's got a wonderful portrait of George Washington yes. from the colonial era. and. Uh, it's, it's a very nice, very special little gallery at the beginning yes. there. And it really is, and when you walk through, you have really a panorama of American art, right, in that little, right. not a very big space, but you certainly get a lot. And then right in the lobby, you have the George Siegel bus shelter, which is great. Right, right. Well, that was, a, I think, a, a wonderful uh, acquisition for the mm -hmm. museum. Now, is the museum constantly acquiring new works, or do you... You... Yes, we are. We're always looking to supplement our collections, and so that's an active part of, of, of what we do. Mm -hmm. yes. Are you personally involved in that? I am involved in that, yes. We have all of our curators and I are involved in the acquisition process. Yeah. Yeah, that's, as I said, it's a wonderful resource for central New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So what else would you like to tell us about the museum? Well, I think I want to tell people to come in, uh, okay. come in often because we do a, a good number of shows here per year, uh, sometimes uh, 15 or more. So if you come into the Zimmerle, there's, you're probably always going to see something new because we, uh, we have so many changing exhibitions. And every time you come, uh, well, you can, can never see everything in one visit anyway. Right. So you can, right. I guess, just go into one of the areas and concentrate on that. Mm -hmm. And what it, I think is really fun is uh, when you have the workshops for children, because even young children can really enjoy themselves here. Right. That's, uh, that's been a very popular program. We have, uh, have after-school uh, drawing clubs uh, for, uh, 
for school children and we have summer art camps and uh, those have proven to be very, very popular mm -hmm. for us. The summer art camps, could you tell us a little bit about that? Those are, um, there's a couple of different sessions in the summer and um, they're both half day and full day sessions mm -hmm. and they're led by a trained instructor and we've had a great response to them. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a good it's a good opportunity for students to get introduced to some of these uh, art making activities. When will you be starting to take registrations for that? Do you know? Probably in the spring, mm -hmm. and then the, the programs will begin in June. Great. So, yes. Well, we thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us, and I wish you lots of luck in your job here, I'm, and I hope you get some of the funding back again. Yes, thanks very much. It's my pleasure. Well, that's the end of our program. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, and I hope that you all have a chance to come to see these wonderful exhibits in person. It's a very uh, convenient place to get to. We want to thank uh, Greg Perry and Jeffrey Wexler for taking the time to speak with us, and I hope you enjoyed the show.